Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to our Tuesday night online church services. We are coming to you live from Long Beach, California. Me and my wife are currently on a mini tour of Southern California right now, and this just happens to be our latest stop here in Long Beach. And we are very grateful and thankful that you have joined us this evening for service. We pray that the Lord has a word for you that will enrich your soul and lighten your spirit because in these dark times we all need something to lighten our spirit amen well traveling light to be in my wife's spirit so we're going to get back to this little vacation in time and y'all enjoy this praise and worship song. amen somebody say be glorified if you would come down to the front and worship with us let's celebrate the king together put your hands together God, we bless you. That's it. I see you coming. Oh, God. Now lift your voices and give him glory. Give him glory. Be glorified, God. We lift your God for creating another day that we can walk in and worship you in, Lord. If you are grateful that we serve a God who hears us when we cry out to him, who protects us when we need him, who provides for us whenever we need things, then you need to be giving him a mighty hand clap of praise right now. 
Thank you, Lord, and thank you, Lord, and thank you, Lord. Doesn't he deserve all of our worship? He deserves all the glory. He deserves all the honor. So make sure that you give him the glory and honor he is due by worshiping him for all that he is. Not just for the stuff that he does for you, just for him being who he is, because there is no one else like him in all the universe. Amen. And with that, we say greetings. Thank you. Welcome for uh, welcome, and thank you for joining us for our Tuesday night online church services, y'all, where we give all glory to God for what he is doing every single week through this, his Global Church Body Alliance. And y'all know how we start? We got to say what's up to our peoples. So shout out to our beautiful, beloved, majestic sister church in Garland, Texas, Oasis on the Mount Church and Healing Center. Led by my brother, Pastor Chris Pipkin. Greetings, Oasis. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. Thank y'all for being here, as always. Listen, if you want to be a blessing to Oasis, then make sure you go watch their um, services that they have on Facebook every Sunday morning at 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central. I believe that's what, 6.30 Pacific. And if you can't watch them live, on Sunday mornings, then just go to their Facebook page any other time to watch that service as it'll replay throughout the week. You can also visit their website. The link to the website for Oasis and to their Facebook page are both in the chat right now. We love you, Oasis. We always appreciate y'all joining us in fellowship and making this global church body what it is based on your love and contribution. So we appreciate all of our folks at Oasis, as well as all of our friends around the world and our sister ministries in other countries, India, Africa, Pakistan, the UK, Germany. Shout out to everybody, wherever you are. We appreciate you. Thank you for always supporting Benevolent Faith Ministries and for being a part of the Global Church Body Alliance. Listen, we encourage y'all, spread the word about our service on Tuesday night. Hit that invite button. Invite somebody to come out to worship with us. Say, look, man, it's only an hour. You get in, you get out, you get on with your life. If they go over an hour, it's not by much, and it's probably because the word, the Lord had an important word that he wanted the people to hear. So y'all make sure y'all let people know about this service. Of course, if they can't make it on Tuesday, they can always come out on Wednesday, very same platform, the same link that you used to access to get to tonight, to get to us tonight. Same link, give that to them, and they can watch us on Wednesday at 1 Eastern, noon Central, 10 a.m. Pacific, which is when this service replays every Wednesday. And of course, you can always just copy and paste our YouTube link that you see in the chat right now. Give them that. So here, look, just go watch everything they've done over on their YouTube channel. And as I mentioned last week, we're going to be ramping up our YouTube channel and doing some different things in the second half of 2024 with our YouTube channel. So y'all stay tuned for that. Amen. And at this time, we ask that you stay tuned for this week's announcements. It's here, a world with amazing adventures and Christian messaging your kids will love. Introducing TruePlay, multiple games in one app, a safe and trusted platform. Go to TruePlayGames.com today to learn more. Amen, amen. Hey, listen, y'all already know what it is. It's our giving campaign. We were calling it our summer giving campaign, but we have now extended it throughout the rest of 2024. So we are calling it our 2024 campaign known as Operation Feed the World, where we're trying to feed as many people as we can with the word of God in addition to feeding them with the nutritious meals that they need because they are sorely lacking in their country due to funds 
or persecution or whatever it is. You've seen the videos, you've seen the pictures that we've been posting that have allowed your funds, have allowed us to establish educational centers in Pakistan and India. Kids are eating things that they've never had before for the first time, having cookies for crying out loud. They've never enjoyed those before. They're getting to enjoy that. All these amazing things based off of your contributions. We thank you so much to everybody that has given to this Operation Feed the World campaign. We're going to be continuing it for the rest of the year. We're going to be doing some much bigger things in the fall. So y'all make sure y'all look for that. And if you can, please contribute to the campaign. You'll see the giving link in the chat right now. Just click on that. It'll take you to our website and our uh, Benevolent Faith Ministries Fellowship Fund, which sponsors all of our sister church activity. Uh, that's where it will take you. And you can just give. And you can give a little. You can give a lot. Whatever you give, every dollar is going to go directly towards helping our sister ministries around the world. So thank y'all for being part of that campaign. And of course, we encourage y'all to be part of that True Play campaign as well, where you can earn $25 for every child who you refer to the True Play games and they actually download the games and start playing them. True Play has a lot of fun Christian games. They're very exciting. They're not boring. They're not corny. They're just like not as violent or graphic or profane as the other games that kids play on PlayStations and Xbox and whatnot. So we encourage y'all. You know some children? Tell them to go ahead and download that True Play Games app. And you can get paid in the process as part of their True Play affiliate pro program. Just go to TruePlayGames.com for more information on everything that I just mentioned. Shout out to True Play. We love y'all. But tonight, my friends, tonight our scripture passage is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. I'm going to be reading this from the New Living Translation version of the Bible. And the word of the Lord reads as follows. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Tonight, my friends, I want to speak from the subject single-minded. Single-minded. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God in heaven, we are just sitting in awe of you, Lord, as we behold your majesty, behold your glory, Father God, and behold your sovereignty over our lives. Lord, we submit everything within us to you. And as we do, Lord God, we pray that we will collectively be able to come together in unity and with a sense of purpose and single-mindedness. The same sense of single-mindedness that rested with these folks on the day of Pentecost. Help us, Lord. Help us to follow their example and how they sought after you openly and how you responded to them as a result so that our churches can be empowered in this age to act with your power resting upon them. Lord, you make all things new. And you will make this new to us tonight. I just ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are pleasing in your sight. Move Adrian out of the way. 
they don't need to hear from him. They need to hear from you through your vessel that delivers this word. And we pray that that will happen, Father God. Let your spirit fall fresh and new this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let me hold out there and say amen, amen, and amen. Single minded. I'm living the single. Well, not that kind of single. You know, a lot of people know the story of how me and my wife came to be together, right? And for those that don't, we worked together. I'm going to give it a very short version. We worked together for about 10 years and never once saw each other. Not a picture, not a video, nothing. We only talked, only talked on the phone. And so when I finally did go out to see her, in June of 2007, we fell in love and I started going back and forth, flying back and forth from Omaha, where I'm from, shout out to Omaha North Coast Stand Up, from Omaha to South Jersey, where she was born and raised. And eventually, it got to the point where all that flying back and forth was not going to cut it. One of us had to move. It ultimately ended up being me that moved out to South Jersey. But a lot of stuff had to happen in order for that to come to be. But the point is that I was single-minded with respect to moving to New Jersey. Once we made up the made up our minds that look, we this long distance marriage thing is not gonna work. We're gonna have to both be together in one place. Because we missed each other too much. But once we made that decision of where we were gonna be. That single-mindedness of purpose was all I could focus on. Getting to New Jersey, even though I, A, had no real plan on how to do that, and B, didn't have a job lined up if I did go out there. So I was kind of flying blind. And for me, the blessing was that the Lord stepped in in a miraculous supernatural way and made a way for all of the things that we needed to happen to fall into place perfectly. And I moved out of there and we ain't looked back since. We've been happy ever since all these years later. But oftentimes that's what being single-minded does. It makes your focus laser sharp such that your commitment to accomplishing that thing that you wanna accomplish is the driving force behind all you do. Because that was for sure me. I wanted to be with my baby. So I made sure I did everything I could to try to facilitate that happening, and God did the rest. That's what being single-minded does. It means having only one purpose, only one goal, only one interest. It means being focused on only one thing exclusively, and that focus drives you toward getting that thing. And friends, it was the single-mindedness of the early church that made it so dynamic, the fact that they were so single-minded, meaning everybody had the same goals and interests, and they were all working towards the same purpose. And our text tonight is speaking about the events which transpired on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th, and it refers to the Jewish feast, which is held 50 days after the second day of Passover. It's also known as the Feast of Weeks. You see it referred to it uh, as that in Exodus chapter 34, verse 22, and in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 10. And it's also known as the Feast of the Harvest, as we see in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16. So when you read those phrases, they're talking about the uh, Pentecost, okay? So they're talking about the, the uh, excuse me, the Passover, excuse me. Essentially, Pentecost was a day of thanksgiving for the Israelites. It was a day for them to mark the end of the grain harvest. It was a holy Sabbath day. And people were expected to attend this feast, and they were required to make an offering to the Lord. So we see from Scripture that prior to the day of Pentecost, Jesus 
set the tone for the arrival of this day that we read in our text by informing his followers ahead of time that he was going to send the Holy Spirit once he departed. Look at John, Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Let me read that in the easy to read version, the ERV. I will send you the helper from the Father. The helper is the spirit of truth who comes from the Father. When he comes, he will tell about me. And you will tell people about me too because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus is like, I'm gonna send y'all some help, okay? That was before he resurrected. So then after he resurrected, he was with them for another 40 days prior to the day of Pentecost. And then he ascended back to heaven. Look at Acts chapter one, verse three. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. And as with many other events in the Bible, because we've talked about this um, concept before, Pentecost, the day where the Holy Spirit came to all the people, it was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. First, the prophet Joel spoke about it, right? Look at Joel chapter three, verse 18. And that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk. Water will fill the stream beds of Judah and a fountain will burst forth from the Lord's temple, watering the arid valley of Acacias. That is an allusion to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The arid valley is all the dry people, all the dry, thirsty, sinful people that need that spirit in order to be stay connected to God. Then in the Gospel of Matthew, we see that John the Baptist also spoke of the pendency of this prophecy. Look at Matthew chapter three, verse 11. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy to even be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So you had these two prophets of God Joel and John the Baptist talking way before it ever happened about how the Holy Spirit was going to come on the day of Pentecost, right? And so it was on that special day set aside to praise the Lord for giving his people a great harvest. It was on that special day that the Lord began to harvest the lost souls in the world through his church, changing the world forever. You know, some really amazing events took place on the day of Pentecost. And while we could never as a modern church duplicate or replicate the events that happened on that day, we can duplicate or replicate the conditions that existed amongst the people of God on that day. We can't relive the miracles they went through, but we can act like they were acting as they received those miracles. The same way those folks saw the Lord move in their midst in power and glory, we can have that same experience as people of God. We just have to properly set the atmosphere in order for that to happen, right? Yo, you know what set the atmosphere means? Think of it like this. There's a party that's getting ready to happen. It's a surprise party. The person who's the, the guest of honor at the surprise party hasn't arrived yet. If they get there and everybody at the party's like, happy birthday or surprise, they didn't quite set the atmosphere properly, did they? They're going to be all decorating and everybody's excited. Oh, I can't wait till they get there. We're going to surprise them. They're never going to see this coming, right? So when the person walks in the door, it's like, surprise! They set the atmosphere properly. We want to experience the Lord's power and might in our churches. We got to set the atmosphere. 
We can't be going to church like, mm, everybody clap your hands. Right? Why would God want to inhabit a church like that? Inhabit praises like that? Because we pray for God to inhabit the praises of his people, but not like that. Right? What we see on Pentecost is the people comporting themselves with a sense of single-mindedness in a way that if we do it, we'll experience God move in a mighty way in our churches and our lives as well. And in order for a collective body of believers to properly set the atmosphere for the Lord, each of those believers must dedicate themselves to sharing a single-minded sensibility. Everybody say single-minded or type it in the chat. That is, modern believers need to get to a point where we all share the same goals and purposes and interests, where we're all focused on only one thing, and that's glorifying God through abiding in Christ, doing what he says, and being obedient, and sharing the good news about him. Period. You know, one of the more spectacular characteristics of the early church was that they were always together with one accord. You see that in the Bible a lot. And the word accord means to have one mind. In other words, they were single-minded. See, these early disciples, there was 120 of them. They were single-minded in their desire to seek the face of the Lord. And you can see this clearly in the first chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. Look at those. By the way, you'll see the notes in the notes section, and you can follow along in the notes, as well as hit the Bible tab and follow along in your favorite version of the Bible. I'm going to read this in the ESV, English Standard Version, as a matter of fact. Acts chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. So it was 120 of them. And unity was the calling card of the early church. And it's, should what, it's what should mark us as well. Saints of God, if we want to experience the Lord's presence and power in our churches these days, then God's people are going to have to walk together in unity with a single-minded purpose. And that's what we're going to be discussing tonight, y'all. From this text, from the story about what happened on the day of Pentecost, we're going to examine the ways in which the early church was single-minded in purpose. And prayerfully, it's going to motivate us to seek that same sense of unity in the same areas as the early church did and by the same methods that the early church used. So first, when we look at this text, we see that the single-minded church, by way of example, has a single-minded purpose. It has a single-minded purpose. Straight out of the text, look at verses 4 and 5. Acts 2, verses 4 and 5. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. In other words, everybody was gathered and waiting on the Lord Together. They were all together. Friends, togetherness is a trait that should mark every church today. And the Bible is clear in its promotion of this ideology. Just look at what the Apostle Paul says to the church of Philippi, the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 27, verse 1. Look at Philippians, excuse me, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together 
for the faith, which is the good news. Here we are told to, quote, stand together with one spirit and one purpose. And when you actually interpret the ancient texts literally, this phrase means to work together as athletes. That's really what it's saying. In other words, we're a team, right? <laughs> we are supposed to work together for the glory of God, carrying out his will in the world as a team. Think of a team sport, any team sport, right? They can only win the championship. They only go get the title if everyone works together. The players got to carry out their assignments. The coaches got to lead properly. The general manager has to hire the right people to bring the right people in. Everybody works together doing their part in order for the whole team to win. And it works the same way in the church, my friends. In fact, church is often referred to in the context of being a team sport. Our church, the church that we attend, my wife and I, shout out to the Way Community, uh, the Way Community Church in Congress, Georgia, Dub CC Gang Gang. Our church teaches a, a course called Church is a Team Sport because it really, that analogy rings so true. As a team, we each have different functions on the team compared to a football team, right? A football team has a quarterback, a running back, wide receivers, offensive linemen, defensive linemen, linebackers, defensive backs. Then they got head coaches. They got offensive and defensive coordinators. They got positional coaches, right? Everybody does their part to contribute to the success of the team. And the church operates in the exact same fashion with different people taking up different positions based on the skill assessments necessary for them to qualify for those positions. You've been playing running back all your life. You're not going to suddenly try to be a quarterback. Your skill assessment, the assessment of your skills dictates, oh, he can run the ball. Oh, he'd be mad running people over. We need to make him a running back, right? Or, wow, he's got a really strong arm. He's got really good field vision. We need to make him a quarterback. Friends, in the kingdom of God, one true skill assessment that we have is known as a spiritual gifts assessment. It's a, a quick quiz that you take and ask you a bunch of questions about who you are, your likes, your dislikes, the things that make you you and about your nature, and it's all amalgamated together to tell you where your spiritual gifts lie. And that's how we do a skill assessment in the church. Because in a, in a, on a sports team, you can watch film, you can watch practice, and you can assess their skills that way. You're not going to watch people as they live out their lives every day. But when they take this spiritual gifts assessment, it tells you the gifts that the Lord has given them. And I know a lot of people will go, why would you rely on a test? Trust me, that bad boy is very accurate. It is extremely accurate. I've taken one, my wife's taken one, my daughter's taken one, and all of my friends in the church have taken one. And every single time, we'd be like, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. And you'll score high in those areas where you, where you know you have your greatest strengths. Wonderful assessment of where you are in the kingdom of God. And we need to do that so we can know what our job is supposed to be as we work on the team in the kingdom. Paul outlines this clearly, okay, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He talks all about, you know, the different parts of the body and everybody doing something different. But here's, look at what he says in part. I'm going to read just part of it. It's verses 7 to 11. Look at what he says in verses 7 to 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. 
He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So all of our gifts come from the Lord and the spirit discerns with us, letting us know what those gifts are. And that assessment test will also help you know what your gifts are. But when you're in tune with the spirit and you're praying and you're doing the things you're supposed to, the spirit will start to reveal to you what your gifts are and where God wants you to work to use those gifts for his glory. But with just like with any other team, different functions should not prevent us from all having the same goal. That is that everything that we do is for the glory of God, period. That's the single-mindedness we need to have. Again, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that quote, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's our single-minded purpose as a church body. Now, I know that you've often heard the phrase, there's no I in team, right? You've heard that before. Well, this concept also applies to the church, y'all. And it has been applicable since the early days of the church that we're reading about right now. I mean, we do see, don't get me wrong, there were some glory hounds in the early church, right? People who were seeking self-glorification over the needs of group preservation. They was looking out for themselves more than they was looking out for everybody else. They didn't have a sense of unity and single-mindedness. They had a sense of individual mindedness, okay? I'm singly minded about my business. That's what they were about, right? And we see a perfect example of this in the book of 3 John, in the story of Diotrephes. See, 3 John is an extremely short letter, right? And it's in 3 John that we see the first and only mention of a man named Diotrephes. And he was an arrogant, self-seeking troublemaker in some unknown, unnamed church, local church, in the first century. We don't really know nothing about his background other than the fact that he was a Gentile, okay? And John wrote 3 John to his friend Gaius. And here's what he said about Diotrephes in verses 9 and 10. Here's what John wrote to Gaius about Diotrephes. I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he's making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. Whew. This dude was tripping, right? So remember, this is John right now. This is an apostle. So this dude thinks he's so, first of all, he's not even a Jew, he's a Gentile. He thinks he all that to the point where he's turning the apostles away and other teachers. And then when other people say, forget what uh, Diotrephes said, come on in, we'll welcome you and we know who you are. He puts those people out of the church. This is the glory hound single-minded sensibility, sensibility, and when I say single-minded, I mean selfish, arrogant sensibility that one person can have in the body of Christ, and it affects not only the whole church, but it affects the entire kingdom. The fact that we can see traces of each of these attributes of diatrophies being present and applicable when we examine the state of our churches today. Churches all around the world are filled with diatrophesis, okay? Beloveds, do not get caught up in these same type of antics. Do what God has called you to do with your gifts and be what he has called you to be. Don't let others hold you back 
from the gifts God has given you and for the love of everything sacred, do not be the type of person that holds others back from expressing the spiritual gifts and utilizing the spiritual gifts that God gave them. We may all have different ideas, but once a consensus is reached, we should all break out of the huddle and stand together. Imagine a group of, of the offense on a football team being in a huddle and one player don't agree with the play. So when they go ready, break and they break the huddle and they go back to line up. He like, no, he's still standing back in the huddle like, man, I'm not doing this play, right? That is not going to work, right? They're going to get penalized, 15 yards or five yards delay a game. That player probably gets kicked out. The team gets mad. The fans get mad. It's not good all around to try to stand out and have your own way done when that's not the time to do it and when your way might not be the best way for the team. You understand what I'm saying? Remember, Satan is a divider. The Apostle Paul told us that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So Satan is a divider, but hallelujah, Christ is a uniter. Satan's a divider, but Christ is a uniter. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 puts it this way. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Unity, sense of purpose, single-mindedness of purpose. Amen? So we see that. The single-minded church has a single-mindedness of purpose. Next, from the text, we see that the single-minded church engages in single-minded prayer. The single-minded church engages in single-minded prayer. Again, we're right out of the text, Acts chapter 2. Later, in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, which we did not read, as a direct result of Peter's post-Pentecostal sermon, because after the Spirit came on everybody and people were like, yo, why is everybody speaking in language that we can understand? Are they drunk? Peter was like, no, they're not drunk. Let me tell y'all what's happening. And he preached a sermon right after that. And as a result of that sermon he preached, the Bible tells us that after the Holy Spirit had descended upon the believers and Peter gave it that, uh, delivered that sermon, quote, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. So Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit falls on these people, they start speaking in tongues. Other people are like, yo, what is going on? That's crazy. Peter explains to them what's going on. And as a result, 3,000 people believed on the spot and joined the church right there. And during this time, it says that they, all those same folks who began the early church after Pentecost, it says they prayed together. In fact, they prayed with and for one another. Saints of God, nothing builds the sense of single-mindedness in a church more than carrying each other's burdens to the Lord in prayer. I'm taking it from me. Paul told the church of Galatia, Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too, you're too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. <laughs> Paul was like, uh, you're not all that. <laughs> okay. See, there's a bond that develops between people 
who pray together. Trust me, as somebody that has been part of a men's group that's been praying faithfully every Monday at 7 a.m. for the past 10 years, and a men's group that's been praying faithfully together every Wednesday at 9 a.m. for the past six years, trust me, prayer bonds people together. Sharing your burdens with other people bonds you to them in a way that I can't even begin to explain. Think about it. If I pray for you to get healthy, then once you do, I get to share in that happiness with you because I bonded with you in prayer that God will heal you. And once he does, we get to celebrate together. In other words, we are both bonded by our mutual desire to see you get better. And this brings up another extremely important aspect of prayer, y'all. And that's that when we pray for others, it allows us to be less focused on ourselves and on our own problems. And that's biblical. You're like, but I got a lot of problems, Rev. I understand that. But the word of God tells us not to worry about those things and to instead put our focus upon praying for and helping other people. Don't listen to me. Look at Philippians chapter two, verses three and four. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Pretty clear, right? So we've seen that the single-minded church has a single-minded purpose and engages in single-minded prayer. Next from the text, we see that the single-minded church is single-minded in power. They're single-minded in power. And this, again, verses um, three and four, it says that, quote, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. The single-mindedness of the early church came about because each of them was right with God and filled with the Spirit of God. When everybody works on themselves individually, when they come together collectively, it makes them all the more powerful. Why? Because they're focused on themselves and not the next man. How you gonna come to church when well, you're supposed to be praying and getting your relationship with the Lord and all you wanna do is go and gossip about what other people are going through or gossip about what the next man has experienced, right? It should be a singular focus that you bring to the group so that it turns into a collective focus. In other words, the church can't get right until everybody individually commits to getting some act right amongst themselves. You got to get yourself together before you can go around a bunch of other people and pray with them that y'all all get y'all stuff together. Because if y'all all praying, Lord, help us to get it together, and one person is not getting it together in their own life, they're going to throw everything off. You see what I'm saying? It was a sense of single-mindedness that produced amazing results in the early church. They preached the same message. You see that in chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 11. They believed in the same things. You see that in verses 41 to 44a. They carried the same burdens as we just read. You see that in verses 4, 44 and 45 and 34 and 35. And they all loved the same things. You see that in verses 46 and 47, right? You see how unified and cohesively they all moved together. They was on some real Luda stuff. When I move, you move. Just like that, right? Because one of the problems in the modern church, y'all, is that the members are all in different stages of spiritual development, right? You may be all sanctified and saved, but Miss Johnson's son ain't, right? Some people are saved, but they're immature. They know who the Lord is. They accept him as their Lord and Savior, but they're not maturing in their faith, and they're still acting worldly sometimes, Right? Some people are saved and growing. They're saved in the Lord and every day they're getting closer to him and you can see it in the way they talk and act and walk, right? And of course, some people are saved and they're just completely spirit-filled. They're just filled with the spirit of the Lord and it just emanates from them, right? 
Then, of course, there's people in church that ain't saved at all. They've been coming there for 30 years, and they still ain't um, confessed Christ as their Lord and Savior. True story. It really happens. Everybody's at a different level in the church. And that type of diversity makes it difficult for the whole family and for the team. It leaves the church fractured and splintered, and the work can't get done as effectively. Just because everybody's on the same, not on the same level, don't mean that the work can't get done effectively. What is the problem is when not everybody's on the same level and they don't want to acknowledge it. And then they want to contribute their little bit, not knowing that the Lord knows that little bit you contributed, you don't really care to do that. So I don't really want that. You're holding back the body by not giving your all, getting yourself together before you come around all of us so we can all get ourselves together collectively. It doesn't work if we're all trying to get ourselves together and y'all over here partying and doing whatever y'all want to do. But then y'all come together with us like we all have the same mind. We don't have the same mind. Y'all out here over there, and we're here with the Lord trying to get straight. That's when the problem comes in about the diversity of where people are in their walk, right? Paul told the church in Ephesus very plainly in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the people over here still doing worldly stuff, you can't say that the Spirit's living in you if you still have a strong desire for the world. Because that's what's ruling your life. And remember what John 8 verse 44 says about Satan being a father of lies and about us being his children if we go after him and follow his ways and not the ways of the Lord. Jesus was very clear. You follow Satan's ways, you follow the ways of the world, you ain't God's child. You ain't my little brother or sister. You're not in our family. So y'all see how that sensibility of those over here, but acting like they're like the people over here can fracture and splinter the power and effectiveness of the church. We got to be unified in purpose and prayer. And as this last one just told us, single-minded in power as well. So single-minded in purpose, single-minded in prayer, single-minded in power. Last one and I'm done, y'all. From the text, we see that the single-minded church is single-minded in performance. They're single-minded in performance. Look at verse um, four again. But they began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. In other words, every person in attendance was busy doing their part. Everybody accepted their responsibility in that moment. Saints of God, please hear me when I tell you, God did not save anybody just for them to sit on the sidelines, okay? No, he saved all of us so we might serve him. God did not save you so that you could come to church every Sunday and sit there like this, like, okay, tell me something I need to hear. No, God saved you so that you can testify about how great your life is now that he has saved you so that someone else can start living that saved life as well. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 puts it this way. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. James chapter two, verse 18. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Listen, don't never forget, friends. Never, 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 never. Forget. A faith does, your faith will not work if you don't put it into action. Faith without works is dead. Your faith without you acting upon what you believe in, will produce nothing. That's not faith. That's fake. Make sure we know the difference. Amen? So as we close this evening, y'all, let me just reiterate that our churches today will never develop a single-minded sensibility 
if we don't collectively make the effort to come together in unity for the sake of the kingdom. You know, there's a very famous evangelist. His name is Vance Hafner. And he once said something very profound. And it's very true. Check out what he said. He said, quote, snowflakes are fragile things, but when they stick together, they can stop traffic. Isn't that an amazing thought? When you see a snowflake fall on your hand, or like when we were kids, we used to let them fall on our tongue, right? It's so harmless. It's so fluffy and light. But let a gajillion snowflakes fall in a few hours, and suddenly can't nobody go nowhere because the streets are shut down, the highway shut down, right? And the snowplow has got to come out and move it. Otherwise, ain't nobody going to be traveling for quite some time until it melts. Y'all see that? You see the power that a snowflake has when they come together collectively? They can shut the world down. Individually, they ain't going to do a whole lot. Collectively, they can shut the whole world down, right? You know, here's another example. My absolute favorite, one of my absolute favorite cartoons of all time is the Peanuts Gang. You know, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, all of them, right? So this one time, Linus, you know, the one with the blanket, he was watching TV, right? And so his sister, Lucy, enters, and she demands that Linus change TV channels. And she starts threatening him, right? So Linus is like, what makes you think that you can just come in here and take over? And she goes, she holds up one hand, and with the other hand, she grabs him by the collar and pulls him close to her hand. And she says, I'll give you five good reasons. One, two, three, four, five, right? And she folds all her fingers down to make a fist and waves it in his face as if to threaten him with violence. To which he says, those are good reasons, right? As he hands her the remote. Then he turns and looks at his own fingers like this. And he goes, why can't you guys get organized like that, <laughs> right? Beloved saints of God, when it comes to believers, individually, just like those snowflakes, just like those fingers, we're limited in what we can do. But when we come together to form a single-minded unit, we become a formidable weapon for the world to behold. The unity and single-minded nature which the first church shared after Pentecost will only be experienced by us if and when we start walking and working together. We need to look at each other same way that Linus looked at his five fingers that were spread apart, and we need to be asking each other, why can't we get organized like that? Right? Because only through our collective efforts. Only through us showing a sense of unity and togetherness, single-minded purpose, single-minded in prayer, single-minded in performance, single-minded in power, only those things will ever be able to experience them is when we start coming together as people of God who are committed to being single-minded. Amen? But listen, you can't be single-minded with people who believe something that you don't believe, which means that you have to know and love Christ the same way that they do. And that means you got to first accept him as your Lord and Savior. Here's your chance to do it. Is there one? Won't you come? Aren't you tired of being alone in this world or being a part of a group of people who just don't seem like they're going anywhere fast? And in fact, are going in the opposite direction where they need to be going. They're immature. They won't grow up. They keep engaging in all these habits that are going to lead to their death or their destruction, whatever. And you're just tired of that. You need to get with some folks that love the Lord and are trying to get to heaven and want you to go with them. And we can help you do that. If you need a good church home, whatever city that you live in, we can recommend one. One that's going to feed you with the word of God and not with a bunch of platitudes and empty promises and a big 
uh, show of praise and worship and all these lights and all this other stuff. No, they're going to give you the word, which is exactly what you need. And you're going to come together with these people. You're going to grow with them. And you're going to have a single-mindedness of, of unity, a single-mindedness, I should say, of purpose and in prayer and all those things we just discussed. But it starts with you first wanting to become a member of such a community. You can't do that unless you believe what they do, which is that Jesus Christ died and rose again and then ascended to the Father. And his death and blood cleansed us of all of our sins. And one day we're going to be with him again in heaven. You got to believe that first. You have to accept him as your Lord and Savior first in order to believe that, to become a part of a community that all believes that. Is there one? Won't you come? Hallelujah. We always applaud at this time for no other reason that we know the seed's been planted. And we just pray, fellow, on good soil, good ground, that your heart was ready for this message tonight. Maybe you go to a church that doesn't act like this. And you're like, man, I need to get with a real church that's actually trying to be like they were back in the days of Pentecost. Let us help you find that type of church wherever you are. Because we're not the only people, we're not the only Christians in the world who are trying to get together with others, fellowship with others, so that we can all be single-minded in our pursuit of God. Amen? There ain't people with that. It's time for giving. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Why? Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. The Lord does not want people to give to his causes, to give to his kingdom with an attitude, an attitude of ungratefulness. So we need to make sure that we're coming into the presence of God with our tithes and our offerings, giving them up to him because he's the one that allowed us to have them in the first place. So it's only right that we give those things back to him. And as y'all know, Benevolent Faith Ministries has a very unique giving model. It's called our Giving Partnerships. What is that? Well, we've already partnered with organizations around the world who are doing the work of the kingdom in various aspects, whether it's organizations that are helping to feed people, whether it's organizations that are helping to share the gospel in foreign countries, you can go to our website, benevolentfaithministries.org, click on the giving tab, and you'll see the list of all of our giving partners. And you can choose which one you want to contribute to so that you know exactly where your money is going because we don't touch your money. We always like to say, we don't want your money, we don't need your money. But our giving partners do. We encourage you to go check out, hit that giving tab and go check out our giving partnerships and come be a part of what God is doing in the world global community in terms of giving back. We have to be a people that gives back. God gives us so much. Why would we not give back to his causes? Amen. Hey, listen, me and my wife are getting ready to enjoy this beautiful beach here in our third home, Santa Monica. God willing, we'll catch y'all next week. God bless.